Well, good morning. Well, at least it's morning for me. This video is about the central limit theorem, and this is section 6.5 in your book. Um, and I want to remind you guys that you're going to complete pages 88 through 91 of the lecture and note taking guide. Uh, while you watch this video, um, the examples are the same. You're just going to be, um, you know, recording in your notes what you see here. And um, also, I want you guys to complete the survey that I gave you. Um, this will just give me some feedback about this video, but be kind. Remember that um, this is my first attempt at uh, making one of these videos. Last time um, during class, you guys each rolled a die um, 36 times, and each of you calculated a sample mean of these uh, rolls. So um, the first thing we want to look at is we want to consider how this random variable y here, so y is going to be the um, result of a roll, right? And then here we have y bar, which is our sample mean. So this is going to be the mean of 36 rolls. So when we think about our roles here, y could be one, I could get a two, three, four, five, or six. So because I can count my number of outcomes, I have six, I know that I'm not continuous because for a continuous random variable, I would have an infinite number of outcomes. So I know I'm discrete. So the next question I might ask myself is, is this binomial? Because remember, binomial is a subset of discrete. It's a special kind of discrete random variable. So we had four criteria for that. I start with my first one, and I say, is there a fixed number of trials? Well, uh, no, I don't think I have a fixed number of trials here because I didn't tell you how many times uh, I rolled this die. So we're going to fail that one. Or another quick... Um, way to know that this is not binomial is I don't have two outcomes, I have six. So I'm not binomial here. So I think y is somewhere over here. It's discrete, yet not binomial. Right? So if y is a discrete random variable, we can uh, calculate the mean and standard deviation. And if you guys, uh, this is our formula here, I'm going to take each value, right, one for example, multiply it by its probability, which is a 6, and I'm going to do this for each value, 2 times a 6, 3 times a 6, 4 times a 6, uh, 5 times a 6, and 6 times a 6. All right, so if I add these up, 1 plus 2 is 3, 6, 10, 15, 26, no, 21 over 6, which this would reduce to... Uh, Three and a half, right? So this is seven halves, which is three and a half. Right? If we wanted to find our standard deviation, we could do that as well. Um, this formula is a little more cumbersome. Uh, so here I'm going to take each value and square it and multiply it by its probability. Plus two squared times a six. Subtract off the mean score. All right. So when we do this here, I'm going to skip a couple steps because you guys have the calculator right in front of you. I'm going to get 91 over 6 minus 49 over 4 is root. 35 over 12, which is about 1.708. All right, but what I hope you guys do, given that you have your calculator in front of you, is go to your statistics menu and you're going to enter the values of x into list one, 
and their uh, probabilities in this too. We want to calculate our one variable statistics. Before we calculate those, I just want to make sure everyone has their set up correctly. So we're going to choose F6 for set and make sure that you have your one variable frequency set like in this too. So if you don't have it set up like this, it's going to ignore your probabilities and only look at um, this one. So here we can exit back and calculate our one variable statistic and we get a mean of three and a half and a standard deviation of 1.708 as we did by here. All right, so we could calculate the mean and standard deviation of this random variable y and we wanted to know how y bar or the sample mean is distributed. Well, if you remember back to the sample means you collected, we had some that might be um, 3.23. I asked you guys to round to two decimal places, but uh, some people had 3.55. If I wanted to count all of the possible um, outcomes here, 3.6, I um, could I count all of these options? I'm going to say no. So this is becoming continuous because there are an infinite number of means here. I know I'm somewhere on this side. So the next question I'm going to ask myself is, are these data normally distributed? So to look at that, we want to generate some of these and see if we have a bell-shaped curve. So we could do a um, histogram for the data that you guys collected in class. But what I want to do here is show you guys how to simulate this. So I'm going to go to my run menu here, and I want to come up with a random integer between 1 and 6. So I'm going to go to my probability menu and choose a random integer between 1 and 6. So what this is going to do is give me, at random, a number between 1 and 6. All right, so here I get 3, then 4, then 5. So this is similar to uh, rolling a die. All right, well, I want to... This is taking me a little bit of time, so if I wanted to roll 36 times at once, then the next input I'm going to say, do this 36 times, and here I have 36 rolls. So that was a lot quicker than actually rolling a die 36 times. So if I want to save these 36, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to store this in list. All right, so what that did, it rolled it 36 times, and if you go to your statistics menu over here, you see all 36 of these rolls are saved here in this too. All right, so now that I have saved those in this too, I can calculate their catalog and what the mean of these data that I stored in this. And I get a mean of 3.5555. All right, so we could uh, much quicker simulate this in the calculator. So this would be one mean. Now, if I wanted to repeat this, I could do it over and over and over again to collect lots of sample means. Well, what I have done is created a little program on the calculator. And this is going to simulate running this over and over. So let me just explain it really quickly uh, for my computer science majors, but don't stress about this. Um, this is just to, to help us get a picture of what this distribution might look like. So what this program does is it's gonna ask me how many times do um, you want to roll um, the die in each sample? And it's gonna store that as a variable R. And it says, how many samples do you want? So this is how many times do you wanna repeat this process? So I'm gonna clear my list and what this says is for how many samples I want, one to up to whatever number you entered, we're going to roll that die that many times and store this in list two. And then I'm going to find the mean of that and store it in list one. So I'm going to keep cycling through this as many times as you told it to. Let's uh, run this. So how many rolls per sample? You guys did 36, so we'll do 36 here. And how many samples do you want? Well, we want a ton. So I'm going to say, let's do this for 500 samples. All right, so here are our 500 uh, sample means. And if I go to my statistics menu, 
those are stored here in list one. So I have all 500 of these guys. And if I look over in list two, that's the last time my sample of 36 rolled. So we can now uh, look at the histogram for these guys. So if I look at this, I get this shape here. So this is a histogram of my 500 means. So I would say this looks fairly bell-shaped. So are these sample means normally distributed? We're going to say yes, they are. How does the mean of our sample means compare with the mean of our original distribution? Um, so remember, our original distribution is what we have over here. Um, each of these outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six are equally likely, and we calculated the mean just a second ago to be three and a half. Or you can think of this as the balancing point as we did on test one. So this distribution would balance right here at three and a half. So just to save some time, I've uh, gone ahead and computed a couple of these histograms. So this was a sample size of two. So I rolled my dice twice and calculated the mean. And I did repeated this 500 times, and I ended up with this histogram here. So we see it looks pretty normal. And if I wanted to find the mean, well, where would this balance? The middle looks somewhere about right here. Maybe. Okay, so I would say that this is the middle, so somewhere around three and a half. So this in this picture here, I rolled my die five times calculated the mean and I repeated this 500 times and again the middle of this distribution looks somewhere about right there um, and this one here I rolled my die 30 times and repeated this 500 times and again the middle of my distribution is about right here so how does the mean of our sample means compare to the original mean well they look like they're about The next thing we want to consider is what happens to the spread of our sample means as the sample size increases. So originally our data could go anywhere between one and six. So our spread here was between one and six, and we got a standard deviation of 1.78. Well, with a sample size of two, I'd probably go from about one to six again. Now here, with a sample size of five, you see here I'm only going from about one and a half to five and a half. So these are a little less spread out. And then as my sample size gets even larger, here I'm going from about two and a half to four and a half, right here. So I'm going to say that what happens to my spread, they become less and less spread out. Or my standard deviation here becomes Smaller. We could calculate the standard deviation using our one variable statistics in our program, but I think this graph shows it well. So this leads us to the central limit theorem. So for a random variable of any distribution here, any distribution, so we just did it for a discrete distribution. So X is just has any distribution. The distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution as the sample size increases. So remember back to the example we just did. Even though the outcome of a die is discrete, which is clearly not normal, when we calculated those sample means, the means were normally distributed. So even if the original distribution is not normal, then with a mean of mu and a sample deviation of sigma, a sample is large enough, and we'll talk in a minute about how large it needs to be. The sample means have a distribution that is approximately normal. And let's talk about this notation right here. This means mu sub x bar. This is the mean of my sample Right, so let's say we rolled a die 36 times and got a sample mean x bar. And then I repeated this and repeated this and repeated this and got lots of these x bars. And 
and then I found the mean of those means. Well, that's just the same as the original mean. We're going to use mu right here. All right. However, we saw here that our um, standard deviation of our sample means, and this is called the standard error of the mean. Right, we saw that these got smaller and smaller. So it's our original standard deviation divided by the square root of All right, so when can we use this central limit theory? So if our original distribution is not normal, that's the case we just looked at, we must have a sample size of n greater than 30. So if I have at least 30 rolls, then we're going to say this is approximately uh, normal. Um, this 30 might seem a bit arbitrary, but, um, well, it kind of is. Um, but this is what we're going to use for large enough. Um, and if the original distribution is already normal, well, we can apply the central limit theorem for a sample of any size. So it doesn't matter. So let's say x is over here and it is discrete. It's mean x, and I'm going to denote that x bar is going to be distributed over here if n is greater than 30. Right, so maybe we have a y that's continuous, yet it's not normal. Its mean is also going to be over here, right, if I have 30 rolls. Well, let's say z is already normal. Well, z bar is going to be over here, no matter how big the sample size is. All right, so let's look at an example. Here I have this die. It's a little different from a die you've seen before. I have three faces with a six, two faces with a two, and one face with a four. So here I can find my probability distribution. My outcomes are two, four, and six. And uh, the probability that I get two, well, this happens two out of six, so that is a third. Probability that I get a four, well, that just happens one time out of six, so that's one six. And the probability that I get a six happens three times out of six, which is a half. If I could come up with the relative frequency histogram here, um, my probability, well, the biggest one's a half. Let's just count by six. One six, this would be one third, a half, this would be two thirds, five six. So I can't get a one, so that's going to be zero. The probability that I roll a two is a third. All right, I can't roll a three. Probability that I get a four, well, that's just a six. And then the probability that I roll a six, that's the one that's most likely, which is a half. I get a relative frequency histogram that might look like this. Well, clearly, this is not normal, right? If it was normal, we would have a bell shape here, which we do not have. And further, um, we see that we only have three outcomes, so we're not even continuous. So how is x distributed? Well, I know, all right, so I know that x can be two, four, or six, right? So because I can count the number of options, I know that x is not continuous. So now I know I'm discrete, but let's see if I'm um, binomial. So are there a fixed number of trials here? And the answer is no. All right, so we could also check our other three criteria. Um, it's not dichotomous. Um, they are independent, and the probability does remain the same, but um, because I don't have a fixed number of trials, I already know that I'm not binomial, so I'm not in here. So x is going to be somewhere out here. It's discrete, yet not binomial. All right. So just like we did before, we can calculate the mean and standard deviation of x. So to calculate the mean, we're going to take each value and multiply it by its probability and add those up. So I would take 2 times a third 
plus four times six plus six times a half. All right. And here I would, let's see, that would be four plus four plus eight over six, which is four millimeter. All right. So similarly, I can calculate the standard deviation. I'm going to take the square root of all this stuff in here. I'm going to take each value and square it. So 2 squared times its probability, which is a third, plus 4 squared times its probability, which is a sixth, plus 6 squared times its probability, And now I want to subtract off the mean squared. All right. So this is going to give us the square root of 29 over 9, which is approximately equal to 1.795. Right. But the way that I hope most of you guys are going to do, do this is go to your calculator and from your statistics menu, I'm going to put my values for x. And list one, and then list two, I'm going to put their probabilities, and I'm going to calculate my one variable statistics. And here I get a mean of four and a third and a standard deviation of 1.795. Now, if I want to know the probability that I roll a number greater than or equal to four, here, it's not greater than or equal to four, but that would be if I rolled a four or a six. The probability that x is greater than or equal to four is going to be the probability that x equals four, or so I'm going to add the probability that x equals six. And so this is going to be a six plus a half, which is going to be four six. Now suppose that we rolled this die 49 times and calculated the sample mean, which we're going to denote x bar. How are these sample means distributed? Well, the, the central limit theorem tells me that x bar is going to be distributed normally, and my mean is going to be the same. And I'm going to use a little x bar down here. This is the mean of my mean. So that's going to be what we had before, which is four and a third. However, the standard deviation of my mean here is going to be my old standard deviation, 1.795. But I'm going to divide by the square root of 49, which is just a second. So if we wanted to find the probability that the mean of 49 rolls of this die is greater than or equal to four, so that's what this x bar is for my mean. I know that these means are distributed normally. So here I can think of a normal distribution with a mean of four and a third. And so I want to find the probability that I'm greater than or equal to four here. Right? So because this is normally distributed, I'm going to use the calculator here to find the normal. CDF. I'm going to go to my statistics menu and choose distribution normal CDF. Right? So here my lower limit is 4. Upper limit, I don't have an upper limit here, so I'm going to put something in the calculator that's very, very large. I'm going to do 10 to the 99. So this is a one with 99 zeros behind it. My standard deviation is going to be my old standard deviation. And now I'm going to divide by the square root of 49. So the um, standard error of my mean is 0.256. And then my mean is going to be 4 and a third. I can come down here and uh, 
calculate this probability, and I get a probability of 0 0.903. probability that x bar is greater than or equal to 4 is 0 0.903. All right, we can also use the empirical rule here because uh, our means are normally distributed. So the middle 95% um, would be somewhere around two standard deviations away from our mean. So what I want to do is I want to find the mean my means plus two times the standard error and I want to find the mean of my means minus two times my standard error. Right. So I'm going to go to my run menu here and my mean was four thirds plus two times my standard error. I get an upper limit of 4.85 and my lower limit change this addition symbol to a subtraction symbol and I get 3.82. So 95% of the sample means for 49 rolls would be somewhere between 3.82 and 4. So I'm going to come back to this example we looked at last time where we had the age of a person's cell phone. So we were um, assuming that these uh, cell phones had a mean age of two years and a standard deviation of half of a year. We said that let's assume that this is normally distributed. And so I know that these are normally distributed. And I have a mean of two years and a standard deviation of five years. So if we wanted to know the probability that a randomly se selected person would have a cell phone that's three years or older. So my mean is at two years. So I'm going to come out here two standard deviations. And I want to know what's the probability that this is greater than three. This is normally distributed, so I can use my normal CPF. I'm going to go to my statistics menu, distribution, normal, I want the CPF. Now I want to know if we're greater than three. So here my lower limit is going to be three. My upper limit, I don't have one, so I'm going to use this very large number. My um, standard deviation here is one half, and my mean is two. So I get a probability of 0 0.023. All right. All right, so now suppose we randomly select nine people and calculate the mean age of this group phones. Would you expect the mean of nine people's cell phones to be more or less likely to be older than three years old as compared to an individual? All right, so let's say here I have for an individual, I have a mean of two. I'm going to go out one, two, three standard deviations, one, two, three standard deviations. Here, if my mean is two, and I want to know the probability that we're greater than three, that would be this area right here. Right? Now, think about 
the standard error of the main. So here, the standard error of my mean is going to be my old standard deviation, which is a half, divided by the square root of m, which is so here, this would be about a six. So I would go one, two, three standard deviations would be two and a half. If I go down one, two, three standard deviations, this would be two. This distribution might look something like Right? So if I wanted to know the probability that we're there is three, that would be this little bit out here, which that's going to be six standard deviations away from the mean. So this would be less likely. Right, so let's see if we could find this probability. So if I'm interested in the probability that my mean is greater than or equal to three, well, I'm going to, I'm interested in my mean, so I know it's normally distributed. So I'm going to use my normal CDF here. So if I exit back last time, we did a lower limit of three, the upper limit of some large number. Well, now my standard deviation isn't a half, it's a half divided by the square root of nine, which is a six. And my mean remains the same. So when we calculate this probability here, now this is scientific notation. So this 9.86 times 10 to the, this means times 10 to the negative 10th power. I'm going to take my decimal and move it 10 places to the left. So this is going to be 0 0.000090 zero this is going to be 0 0.00345678997. So this is very unlikely. All right? Example three here. Suppose that the refrigeration unit at foul eggs. I hope everyone enjoyed my very bad pun there. Um, at the foul eggs plant has broken again. There, in, there is a high probability of one fourth that any given egg has spoiled, independent of the other eggs. Suppose that you buy a carton of a dozen eggs. Let the random variable R be the number of rotten eggs in your carton. So how is R distributed? So we start off here and we say, well, R could be one, two rotten eggs, three, all the way up to 12 rotten eggs. Well, I can count my number of outcomes here, so I know I'm not continuous. So is this binomial? Well, is there a fixed number of trials? Yep, there are 12 eggs. We're going to consider each egg a trial, right? Do we have two categories? This is dichotomous. Well, yep, it's either rotten or not. All right, criteria three. Are these independent? Well, I gave you a little hint here. Yeah, each egg is independent of the other eggs, so yes. And four, does the probability remain the same? It sure does. It is a quarter. So R here is going to be binomial. So what is the mean and standard deviation of R? Well, I could do this the very long way and in list one, enter all my possibilities, which would be one through 12, and then find the probabilities of all those and enter them in list two. But because I know this is binomial, I can use my shortcuts for the mean. So the mean is gonna be N times P, which is 12 times four, which is so on average, each carton is going to have about three rotten eggs. Okay? And I can also find the standard deviation here, which is the square root of n times p, 
times q, which is going to be the square root of 12 times 0.25. Now, q is going to be the probability that one isn't rotten. So if the probability of one is rotten is a quarter, then there is three quarters of chance that it is not rotten. So how did I get this? value here is going to be 1 minus a quarter. So we can find this probability. I am going to use my calculator here. I'm going to get the minus 1 minus and that's the square root of 12 and a quarter and 3 quarters and 3 1 and a half. So now suppose that a local grocer purchases 40 cartons of eggs. What is the probability that the mean number of egg, number of rotten eggs for these 40 cartons is less than or equal to three and a quarter eggs per cart? Right? Because I'm interested in the mean now, I know that this is going to be normally distributed. I'm going to have a mean of three eggs, just like my original distribution. But now instead of having a standard deviation of one and a half, my standard error here of the mean is going to be one and a half divided by root 40. Now I want to know if we're less than or equal to three and a quarter, which would be somewhere over here. I'm interested in this area over here to the left. So I'm going to use my normal BDF. I'm going to go to my statistics menu, distribution, normal, CDF. My lower limit, I don't have one, so I'm going to use a very negative number. My upper limit is three and a quarter. My standard deviation is going to be my whole standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is 40. And then my mean is the same, which is going to be 3. So here I get a probability of 0.854. And the probability that R is less than, I'm sorry, R half. is three and a quarter is 0.854. So next, let the random variable x be the number of hours my Basset Hound Mason spends sleeping each day. The probability density function for the curve is given below. So here, if I'm interested in the number of hours, right, so time here is going to be continuous. But it's not normal, because you see this is not a bell shape here, right, so this is continuous yet not normal. So what is the probability that Mason sleeps exactly 16 hours? Well, probability that any continuous random variable equals one specific value is always zero. Or you can think of, what's the area under the curve? Well, I don't have any width here, so my, you know, if I found the area here, it would just be zero. So what is the probability that Mason sleeps less than 16 hours? So if I wanted less than 16 hours, this would be all of this area here to the left. So if I wanted to find this area, one strategy might be to break this into a rectangle and these two triangles and find those areas. Um, I think I'm going to use a shortcut here. I am going to find this triangle here, this red triangle. I can find its area. 
that's just one step. And then I'm going to subtract it from the total area, which is one. So what I want to do is one minus this little red triangle. Here. This is going to be one minus half base times height. So it's going to be one minus one half. I base here from 16 to 24, that would be eight. And then my height is one. All right, so this is going to be one minus let's see, this is four over twenty-four. So that would be one minus six. Get it five six. So next, the random variable x here has a mean of ten and two thirds hours and a standard deviation of 4.99. What is the probability that the mean hours slept by me? So here I'm interested in the mean. I'm going to use my central limit theorem for 36 days is less than 11 hours. So this is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 10.67. And I want to know what's the probability that he slept less than 11 hours. So that's going to be this area over here to the left. So again, I'm going to use my normal PF. Right, so my lower limit here, I don't have one, so I'm going to use a very negative number. My upper limit is 11. My standard deviation, well, I'm going to take that standard deviation of my original distribution and divide by the square root of my sample, which is 36. So the standard error of the mean is 0.83. And then my mean is 10. Here, I get a probability of 0.654. There's a probability that my mean is less than 11 hours is 0.654. So that brings us to the end of section 6.5, which is the central limit theory.